Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jakub Nowakowski. I'm the director of the Galicia Jewish Museum, and this is an uh, absolute honor and pleasure to welcome you uh, during the uh, third uh, event, uh, third program organized as a part of the um, set of uh, lectures uh, commemorating eight years uh, anniversary of the action Reinhardt. Um, during the first two programs, we had a um, privilege to, to learn, to listen to uh, Professor Michael Birnbaum uh, during the first lecture and then during the second lecture, uh, Chris Webb and Tali Nates. Recordings of those two programs are available at the uh, YouTube channel of Galicia Jewish Museum and has been shared through the um, networks of our uh, partners uh, from Israel and South Africa. Um, and that's going to be um, also true for the third lecture, for the today's lecture. Um, the recording of it will be soon available at the YouTube channel of the Galicia Jewish Museum and will be shared also through the uh, uh, networks of, of the Ghetto Fighters House and the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Um, and and uh, let me just um, express my thanks to our partners. It wouldn't be possible to organize this program if not for the um, Madin uh, Shahar from the Ghetto Fighters House and uh, Tali Nates from the Johannes Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Thank you so much for organizing this, this program uh, with, with us. And I'd like to also thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Jakub Kartulski and Ada Kopecz Pawlikowska from the Galicia Jewish Museum, and also uh, Sergei Tukrina, who is translating to uh, Polish. Um, and I think that's all from my end. And now I'd like to pass the floor to Madin, who will introduce uh, today's uh, program and the speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacob. It truly is an honor to be a partner with the Galicia Jewish Museum and the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center for this series, 80 years after Axion Reinhard, the industrial killing of European Jewry. Today's program, the third in the series, will focus on one camp, resistance in Treblinka, the tangible witnesses. The systematic murder in the Treblinka extermination camp began in July, 1942 with the arrival of the first transport from the Warsaw Ghetto. By the time the camp was dismantled a little over a year later, roughly 900,000 people, the vast majority of whom were Jews, had been murdered there. The existing sources of information available demonstrate how difficult it is to paint a clear picture of what was happening in that terrible place of mass killing. Whether these sources date back to the time the events took place, or were later sources, we can witness the many influences affecting them. Dr. Tamir Hod will present examples of the gaps between memory and history when it comes to the Treblinka extermination camp. His lecture is an introduction to the program and will explain the importance of combining research from different fields, such as archeology span and history, in order to try to grasp the impossible. Professor Caroline Sturdy Coles We'll discuss the tangible and intangible evidence of resistance at Treblinka, derived from her archaeological and historical investigations since 2007, as well as addressing the material traces of resistance at the infamous extermination camp Treblinka II. She will also consider the lesser known role of the inmates and guards from Treblinka labor camp Treblinka I in resistance activities. The program will conclude with a virtual tour given by one of my colleagues, at the Ghetto Fighters House, Yolon Tso. The tour will be of the Treblinka model that is located at the Ghetto Fighters House. This model serving as post-war tangible evidence was built by Yakov Vernik, who was one of the survivors of Treblinka who participated in the uprising in August, 1943. But before I introduce our first speaker, I want to remind everyone that the last program will take place on February 9th. And the topic will be, what do we remember? Who remembers? with guest speakers, James Young, Darius Poviela, and Omar Bartov. The program will be moderated by Ediata Garwon. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Tamir Hod. Dr. Hod is an historian in the field of World War II and the Holocaust, as well as the impact of Holocaust remembrance on Israeli society. The topic of his doctoral thesis was the Manuk trial case in Israel under the guidance of Professor Hannah Yablonka. Dr. Hod has also researched the role the Ukrainian collaborators played in the Treblinka extermination camp. These days, Tamir is working on a book about the Nazi Crimes Investigations Unit in the Israeli police. The unit, which was founded in 1960, was mainly composed of Holocaust survivors and contributed greatly to various trials in different places around the world. 
against Nazi criminals and their collaborators. Dr. Tamir teaches at Tel Chai Academic College and Western Galilee Academic College. And with that, I would like to give the floor to Tamir. Thank you very much, Medin. And uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, I just uh, asked Jakob to share my presentation and uh, I'll begin my uh, talk. Uh, so uh, I was invited to open this evening uh, as a historian in the field for World War II and uh, the Holocaust and discuss the gap between history and memory and hence the role of archaeology in narrowing this gap. Let me start from the end and uh, state that it is uh, difficult to overestimate the importance of archaeology's contribution to the study um, of the Holocaust and uh, we will soon talk about the, the challenges uh, that the study of the Holocaust possessed to the historian. I could uh, actually uh, start my uh, talk, you know, uh, um, from the end um, and uh, saying, yeah, that um, the, the contribution of the archaeology um, to the uh, history, the history of the Holocaust, uh, you, you can't really uh, exaggerate with, the, with that. Um, I could content myself with saying that I know the work of uh, the archaeologist Professor uh, uh, Caroline Study calls in Treblinka, and uh, as well as the work of my friend, the archaeologist uh, Yoram Chaimi, uh, of course, uh, with his college in, uh, in uh, Sobibor, uh, and uh, using a finding from the field. Uh, I come from my opening statement. However, in fact, my conclusion regarding the importance of archaeology stems from a research concept that I use as a guiding principle. Uh, it's also reflect in a statement of the important French historian Marc Bloch, uh, and I quote, you can see it also in front of you uh, in the slide, the danger arises only when each spotlight in itself presumes to be the vision of everything, and when each discrete of knowledge rises up and assumes to be the whole of the motherland. I don't think the quote requires further explanation regarding the importance uh, of combining several areas in order to reveal as many uh, elements as possible in the description of the past. From this standpoint, and I'm sure uh, Caroline uh, would mention it, archaeology also relies on different fields of research that they fitted and also memoirs and diary and uh, et cetera. Now it remains to be explained why many resources are required in the study of the past uh, with the emphasis on the subject we are dealing with today. History, uh, as we all know, is not an exact science. Uh, once an event has taken place, I have no way of uh, reconstructing it in all its, all its uh, details and uh, all that is uh, left for me to do is carry out the research that will bring me as close as possible to what we can describe as what happened. This is unlike a laboratory experiment uh, in which uh, certain materials under certain conditions will show the same results every time. The more complex the incident is and the further back in time we go, the greater the challenges of reconstruction. Let's take an example of the well-known issue in uh, the Holocaust discourse, the number of, vic of victims focusing uh, on uh, Treblinka. When I was working on the research of the Myanmar trial here in Israel, uh, which according to the indictment was Ivan the Terrible from Treblinka, I found six proper and respected sources that indicated the number of uh, victims ranging from 700,000 to 1,300,000. Note the huge gap, and that is in only one extermination camp. If we look in another example, the fact that the United States until the 70s almost completely avoided investigating the past of Nazi and collaborators who immigrated to its territory including those who served in Treblinka, also impaired what we know about what happened in the camp. So uh, you know that many of the sources we've got are coming from, from uh, Holocaust trials, such as the uh, Nuremberg trial, Auschwitz trials, Frankfurt trials, and et cetera. 
So think about the gap, 30 or 40 years, and how many knowledge we can take out of those uh, trials. And um, uh, Jacob, if we can move to the second trial, second slide, um, you can understand it from the next word. From uh, the end of the Nuremberg trials until the mid 70s, the United States proceeded as if the question of Nazi genocide was the concern of other nations. Ellen Ryan, the one-time head of the Department of Justice in charge of identifying and deporting Nazi war criminals, recall that it was as if a curtain of silence had fallen over the Holocaust in this country. Before 73, 1973, only nine cases had been registered against alleged Nazi war criminals residing in the United States. Um, end of quote. So as you can see, this is like, this is quite amazing uh, uh, knowledge for us to think about how many things we can, how many testimonies uh, were lost during those, uh, those years. And you can see also the next example, how it's affect us. And if I may, if it's related to uh, the trial that I was researching, the Damiano trial, you can see in the next slide, uh, the words of uh, George Parker, he was part of the Office of Special, Special Investigation and uh, his, uh, his statement uh, in 1980 uh, gave us a good example of what, uh, how challenging uh, uh, to remember things after so many years. We have a little admissible evidence that the defendants, and we're talking about the Myanmar, yeah? the defendants, what it so, it was it so we were, yet serious doubt as to whether he was a Treblinka. Even if we may be comforted that we may have the right man for the wrong act, the ethical canons probably require us to alter our present position, okay? And also another example, and now I'm going to the next slide. And this one's coming from, uh, from Israel, uh, right before the uh, Myanmar uh, deported to Israel in February, 1986. So the prosecution team uh, had a, a meeting and we're talking about the chance uh, to bring him into uh, to guilty as Ivan the Terrible. And uh, look what one of the uh, young lawyers uh, told me. At some point, some discussion were held when it was already too late and the, and the decision had been made and he was already here. Whether someone who knows how to manage criminal cases would request his extradition of the Mianyu considering all the problems in such a case. Now you're asking me for the answer. He was talking to me, yeah? The answer of some of the people was no, because the tools we have within the framework of the criminal procedures, and after so many years, those tools to verify that this is really him uh, are very limited. And if I mentioned the uh, Nazi and Nazi collaborators uh, in, um, in the United States, we are talking about estimate of uh, 20,000 of them. So you can understand how many trials you could have uh, before that. Um, so as we know, the time passed and uh, I brought uh, uh, a quote from an uh, 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 Auschwitz survivor, uh, famous writer, uh, Primo Levi, uh, passed away in 1986, or uh, as uh, Elie Wiesel uh, said, Primo Levi died at, at, uh, at uh, 1986 or at Auschwitz four years, uh, 40 years later. So let's uh, read what, what Primo Levi is saying. The memories which lie within us are not curved in stone. Not only do they tend to become erased as the years go by, but often they change or grow by adding foreign characters to them. Okay, so now, we can already see that we are touching the importance of archaeology, uh, and we are talking about mem sometimes memory that erase. But when you are digging in the ground or uh, looking for object, uh, some object can never erase and can use you um, as uh, exposing the uh, details from the from uh, the past. However, the effects of time are only part of the story in uh, the case of the Treblinka camp. Oftentimes, the challenges in reconstructing the past are laid uh, before us already upon the end of the event, as 
reflected, and you can see it here, uh, in the words of uh, the, uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre Vidal. And uh, Pierre Vidal is saying the next, uh, the next word. Um, and he was talking about the immediate evidence, referring to the uh, testimonies written of delivered immediately after the war. He claims that these were no more reliable than later testimonies as they were also uh, subjected to various influences. And we can see a few examples also here. So we can go to the, uh, uh, to the next slide. Okay, and this is um, part of the Demyanyuk trial. It's actually at the beginning of uh, March um, uh, 20, uh, 1987. And uh, what can you see in front of you is Treblinka survivor, Elia Rosenberg, getting so close to uh, Demyanyu, as I said, was suspected of being Ivan the Terrible. I also mark the low part of the slide where you can see Demyanyu trying to shake Elia Rosenberg's hand, and this caused like a huge dramatic storm inside the courtroom. So, and right after that, uh, uh, Elia Rosenberg was asked uh, if, he, if he recognized uh, Demyanyuk, and he was saying, yes, uh, I have no doubt. Uh, the man in front of me is uh, Ivan the Terrible. I saw his face, I saw his, uh, his eyes, and no doubt, he's, he's the one. But as you see in front of you, we got a testimony by Elia Rosenberg that was given to a Nazi hunter, Tuvia Friedman, and this is, this is from 1947, so it's only four years after the revolt in Treblinka. The revolt uh, took place at the 2nd of uh, August 1943, so it's only four years, so uh, we can say that uh, objectively uh, the memory is supposed to be still uh, uh, sharp. And I'll just read uh, this testimony. Uh, at quarter to four, a granite explosion was heard from the first camp and some shots from both sides. It was clear to all that the uprising had begun. Zalo grabbed the rifle. Moses, the tailor, who knew how to use a rifle, grabbed another rifle. They lay down on the ground and fired in the direction of the first camp gate so that no help could come. Then we burst into Ivan's room. He was asleep. So Gustavo, who was first, hit him on the head with a spetzel in a such a way that he remained lying down for good. So what Elia Rosenberg actually tell us is, um, uh, is the Manuk, uh, not the Manuk, Ivan the Terrible was killed uh, during the, the revolt. So uh, uh, actually, we, I have many documents and we know that, uh, that he wasn't. Um, and this testimony from 1947, uh, brought into court and what Elia Rosenberg said that it was uh, a wishful thinking uh, and who can blame him, yeah? I mean, if you see your family got killed in front of your eyes, uh, your wishful thinking is to uh, kill Ivan the Terrible a thousand times if you can. Uh, but still, it's, it's a fact of what we know about what happened. So we need to combine few testimonies and get to what exactly happened during the, uh, the revolt. But dealing with, with uh, uh, what happened uh, in Treblinka camp and uh, relying on, uh, on, on the memory and uh, memoir and diaries, the challenge is, is, is begin, I mean, right from 1943. And uh, if you can see the next slide. So we were starting with the fact that in Treblinka, as in Sobibor and other camp, uh, Operation uh, 1005, uh, Zonder Action, uh, was launched, uh, whose purpose was to destroy evidence uh, and, in fact, lead to the almost total uh, eradication of uh, the camp. This figure suggests the importance of archaeology uh, in the study of the Treblinka camp, uh, as you, of course, uh, will hear uh, later on. Let us look uh, at the case of the uprising that took place in, uh, in the camp, uh, the study of which, which also shows the immediate effect faced by the researcher uh, of the past. Pay attention uh, to this conversation from uh, 1979 between Yad Vashem, the chief historian then, 
יצחק שדה, ערד, סורי פור דה מיסטייק, and uh, Treblinka survivors uh, Sonia Lepkovich, uh, יצחק ערד was working on his book about the uprising in the uh, Treblinka, uh, Sonia Lepkovich was uh, later uh, the one that uh, uh, pointed at Demianik and said, yes, that was Ivan the Terrible from Treblinka. Um, let's read this uh, conversation. And uh, they are mentioned Yaakov Wernick that we will meet later and he's a model. He created his model in the mid fifties, the model of Treblinka. Uh, in actually, uh, he wrote maybe the first memoir about uh, Treblinka. It was in 1944 and it's called uh, uh, A Year in Treblinka. It's Hakarad. Uh, who were the other couples in Camp 2? I think Zalo was also a couple, Sonia Lekovich. No, uh, he was not a couple, he was a group leader, but a couple he certainly wasn't. It's Hakarad. I want to point out something that uh, Yaakov Wernick in his book, uh, and his book was actually the first document back during the war, uh, and he, Wernick, uh, was in Treblinka for almost a year, he does not mention Zalo uh, or uh, Adolf anywhere at all. Although in the testimonies of others who were in uh, Camp 2 in Treblinka, Zalo and Adolf are mentioned as key persons. Sonia Lepkovich, Zalo was the only one I saw who actually shoot during the outbreak of the Treblinka uprising. With all respect to Wernick, he was a bit of an a egocentric person, and I think that's why he ignored other who were active underground. So, as you can see, we have the first memoir, it's in 44, and then in 1979, I can hear the words of Sonia Levkovich, and it's putting doubt about what I, uh, what I was reading in something that's supposed to be the closest as we can get to what happened, because it was um, uh, very close to the uh, to the event. Um, just another uh, uh, another example, and I will get to the to the end of my talk. Um, if you can change the slide, you can see another story from the um, uh, from the uh, the, the Mianuk trial. So um, in the photo, by the way, this is Kalman Teigman from the left, and uh, you can also. Uh, uh, see uh, Shmuel Willenberg. They were the last uh, two survivors uh, from uh, Treblinka. Kalman Teigman uh, passed away in 2012 and Shmuel Willenberg in 2016. And uh, what you can read here on the top of the slide, it's a um, um, conversation that I had with the uh, Teigman uh, son. So he sent me the next word and I quote, at the time Demianic was caught, four people remained alive. It's actually not right, there are more. Uh, the leading prosecutor, Michael Shaked, came to my father, who was a key witness. Um, he was a key witness in Eichmann trial, but he was also supposed to be one in the Manuk trial. And my father said, you are just picking on a person who was not in Treblinka. You wish to believe that, but he was not there. It is possible that he was in other places in other camps, but in Treblinka, this man was not, okay? And so uh, Dario Dorne, one of the judges in the, in the trial in Israel, she said, of course, he couldn't see it because he was at camp one. And uh, look at one of the testimonies Teichmann gave before the Eichmann trial, because he gave also testimony in Eichmann trial 27 years before that. It was possible to see through the halls of our camp, the entrance to the gas chambers, Near the cells, they were especially abused by Vachman Rogoza. Yeah, so this is Kalman Teigman before the Achman trial. Uh, I checked it, it uh, was also almost impossible, but look what it's Hakarat saying the same trial. I can estimate that prisoners who were employed in the sorting yard and Jewish prisoners who were employed in the camouflage unit in both cases, it was camp uh, one, uh, due to the work they were assigned to do also come near to the extermination zone camp. So he's saying, yes, there was a chance that they were, that they could see uh, what happened. But think about it, if you're using uh, archeology span and you find some object uh, in, uh, deep in the ground, maybe you can paint the road or the distances between the buildings 
and how can it help to see what, what testimony can, can be reliable. Um, I'm really closing now to, uh, to the end of the talk. Uh, to sum up, uh, I would like uh, us to watch about uh, 25 uh, seconds of uh, footage from the Demiani trial so we can move on to our uh, short uh, uh, video. Um, and this is from the Demiani trial. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's listen to what uh, um, the, the witness, Pinchas Epstein, uh, is trying to do. Treblinka survivors are mercilessly led down the path of traumatic memories in search of the truth about Ivan. What I'm trying to get, Ma Epstein, from you is your memory of the relative distances, locations, <coughs> and elements within the camp that will allow us to arrive at a conclusion on the identification of John Demianyuk. Okay, so this is Bilhas Epstein, one of the five uh, survivors of Treblinka that testified during the trial. Uh, we see the defense attorney request of the witness to estimate the distances inside the camp. Uh, I'm sure that if the help of the archaeologist had been available back in 1987, it would have been possible for the court to gain better understanding uh, of at least some of the events that uh, uh, came up uh, in the trial. Um, and we will get much more help uh, during our uh, next talk. Uh, about that. So uh, thank you very much and thank you, Medin. You're uh, on mute, um, I was on mute. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tamir. Thank you again for this introduction. It really does give us uh, food for thought, um, how we uh, talk about, remember, and uh, very close to the period and then afterwards, many years later, and the things that were asked to remember as well. So thank you so much for that uh, very informable uh, introduction. And with that, I want to move on to our next speaker. Uh, professor Caroline Sturdy Coles is a professor of conflict archeology span and genocide investigation at Stedfordshire University and the director of the Center of Archeology. span her expertise lies in the investigation of Holocaust landscapes using forensic archaeological approaches. Since 2010, she has conducted extensive archaeological investigations at Treblinka extermination and labor camps and is in the final stages of completing her monograph, Finding Treblinka, which provides new historical, spatial, and material perspectives on the crimes perpetrated there. She has undertaken fieldwork at more than 50 other Holocaust sites and has published extensively on the subjects of Holocaust archaeology, forensic archaeology, and missing persons. Professor Sturdy Calls was a visiting fellow at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at USHMM in 2016, and she delivered the pressed prestigious Joseph and Rebecca Meyerhoff annual lecture in 2020. She was also awarded the European Archaeological Heritage Prize for her work in 2016. For the past eight, that, and I'm going to stop with that. I was moving on too quickly. <laughs> I almost went into the next speaker, but um, I just want to say one thing, Carolyn, before you start. I remember the first meeting with you, and I think when all the speakers got together for the first time, we were all sitting in awe uh, with what you have to offer us with your research and investigation. And it just sounds like a CSI program coming to life real time. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Madine, and thank you um, to all of the organisers of today's event for your very kind invitation. I'm just going to share my screen with you, and hopefully you'll be able to see um, my slides on that side. So just uh, give me a nod, Madine, if that is if that is working. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So. Um, this evening, um, I'm going to talk to you about um, a very specific strand um, of the history of Treblinka. Um, I'm going to focus on the various acts of resistance that happened within the camp. Um, I have looked at the participant list. I've seen many uh, familiar names. I've seen many new names as well. So before I begin, I thought it was useful to say a little bit more about the archaeological and historical investigations that I've done at Treblinka more broadly before I may move on to the main topic of my presentation. Um, so, first of all, um, I, as Madi mentioned, I have been working at Treblinka since 2007, and 
my approach uh, is very interdisciplinary. Um, so as, as you'll see from my presentation, but my research covers um, historical source material, as well as taking spatial and material approaches to the study of the landscape of Treblinka as a whole. And I have been um, honored and, and fortunate to be able to carry out many surveys of the site um, in, in 2010 to 2019 inclusive, which have enabled me really to map much of the landscape of Treblinka at the, both the extermination and labor camp sites to try and gain a deeper understanding of many of the aspects of the site that we can't necessarily get from historical source material alone to try and find out about the experiences of the people who were murdered there, which we now know um, totals some 870,000 to a million people at the extermination camp alone. And when I first began working at Treblinka, there hadn't been any investigations undertaken there uh, since the end of the, the Second World War, um, investigations by the Red Army and later by the Central Commission for the Investigation of Nazi Crimes in Poland have, had uncovered some physical evidence, but really um, not many uh, studies had really taken consideration of, of the physicality of the camp, mainly because there was an idea that it had been entirely destroyed um, during the, uh, the post the revolt that happened in August 1943, and as the Nazis decided to level the camp. So my approach really gathers together many different um, many different techniques, um, of which I, I won't have time to explain them all now, but please feel free to ask any questions at the end. I really begin as a historian does gathering as many archival materials as I can, interviewing witnesses, collecting maps, aerial photographs and satellite imagery. And then I also use various remote sensing technologies um, such as LIDAR, which enables you, for example, to create a digital terrain model of the camp and look for subtle undulations, for example, in the landscape or vegetation change that may indicate the presence of buried remains. Um, I then move into walking over the landscape, looking for subtle traces on the surface. And one thing that was remarkable about Treblinka was just how much evidence actually survived on the surface in terms of traces of buildings, evidence of mass graves, and also personal belongings, um, either of victims um, of, or of the guards. I use lots of mapping technologies to map, to map those surface remnants and also geophysical technologies to help me look at buried remains that exist beneath the ground. Um, and although these techniques are not X-ray machines, they do show you signs of disturbance, man-made activity. So they can show you, for example, the foundations of buildings or the possible presence of mass graves. And this approach was very much developed um, with a sensitivity to Jewish law, which forbids the excavation of um, human remains buried in a mass grave. And so the mapping of the site enabled us to identify those grave locations. And then in 2013, I was given permission to carry out some excavations in the areas where we suspected the gas chambers were located and also later in the area of the camp waste pit and the tower, um, the, the camp armory as well, as, we, as we'll discuss later. And much of this work has been um, reported on in other publications um, through visualizations and also through exhibitions that I've completed. And um, just, just very briefly, because it's relevant to what I'll talk about next, in, in short, um, this work, first of all, enabled us to identify the accurate camp boundaries of the extermination camp, as well as a number of key areas within the three zones of which Treblinka comprised. So there was a living camp area in the northern part of the camp, a reception camp area where the trains arrived, and then the death camp where the gas chambers and the mass graves and cremation pyres were located. And I was able to locate a number of reception camp structures using the geophysical technologies. Um, so some of the buried building foundations that still exist across the landscape and also the suspected location of the gas chambers. And, and again, I'll come back to that later on. And as I already mentioned, the location as well of, of several probable mass graves. And in addition to this, um, as I'll also mention, I've also carried out an extensive survey of, of Triple Inca One the labor camp about which the history is much lesser known. Um, but now just to move on to the, to the main topic of the presentation as I'll pick up on many of the findings, of course, in, in relation to resistance. Um, by way of background, on the 2nd of August, 1943, 
um, somewhere between 840 and 1,000 pro-Jewish inmates of the Trouble and Correct Extermination Camp carried out a revolt against the 150 SS and Travniki men that guarded them. As Yitzhak Arad has noted in his, his uh, infamous book, um, having witnessed and heard about uh, the hundreds of thousands of Jews who had been killed in Treblinka, and also having observed a reduction um, and then ultimately a cessation in the number of transports to the camp from January 1943 onwards. The men and women who remained in the camp at this time um, and who facilitated and carried out the revolt had three main concerns. Firstly, they wanted to destroy the very apparatus that had facilitated the killings at Treblinka. Uh, secondly, they hoped to bring the crimes perpetrated at Treblinka to the attention of the world. And thirdly, as they'd only been kept alive to sort the belongings of the victims or to remove them from the gas chambers or to cremate the dead, for example, they realised that as these trans the number of transports was dwindling, they would no longer be needed anymore. And therefore, they realised that escape was really their only chance of survival. Um, the revolt, as it happened in the end, was was did was not realized as it was originally planned um, due to uh, an incident that occurred just before the um, the designated time of the revolt um, in that uh, the the prisoners believed that an informant might have told the guards about the plan um, and therefore they they decided to um, ex ex uh, execute the guard who had had met with this potential informant and the sound of the gunshot, um, was believed by the other inmates to be the start of the revolt, but actually um, this was half an hour before the revolt happened. So what evolved thereafter um, was a much more chaotic uh, revolt than had originally been planned and ultimately meant that many of the objectives of the revolt to destroy the camp uh, were not uh, ultimately met. However, of course, many people did uh, manage to escape, but the revolt itself took many months of planning um, and uh, many committees were formed, which changed personnel over that time to try and realise this, this very um, uh, heroic event. Um, obviously, the, the history of the revolt, I think, is fairly well known, not least of all because we have uh, many publications on it. Yankel Vienix, A Year in Treblinka, mentions it many times, as, as we'll see. Uh, Samuel Willenberg's Revolt in Treblinka and also um, many recent uh, publications as well by historians have discussed um, the history of the revolt. But actually other acts of resistance in Treblinka have been discussed uh, much less. Recently, however, we have seen a shift in this. Um, and so I should say that much of what I'll talk about today comes from my own research, particularly from my book, Finding Treblinka. But also there are many other scholars, most notably at the moment, Chad Gibbs, who's been undertaking an extensive study of oral history accounts and has now identified that 238 survivors, um, at least from the death camp, exist. Um, and of course, there are many more witnesses who provided testimonies about not only the revolt in August 1943, but also many other acts of resistance that happened in the build up to it. Um, we do have many, many sources of resistance. And as the, an archaeologist, as I say, of course, I'm very much focused on the, the landscape and, and the material that um, survey and excavation works can provide. But because I do also take a spatial approach to um, and a material approach to, to history, um, I also utilize a lot of um, witness testimony um, and, and carry out spatial and material readings of those. Also, of course, maps, plans, trial transcripts. Um, and various other sources. Um, there's an abundance of material out there, in fact. Um, and when I was planning this presentation, I actually found it exceptionally difficult to select the material because he Treblinka does have a long legacy of resistance that actually started from when the camp uh, opened, as I'll now demonstrate. Um, and I should say as well, before I move on to some specific examples, that of course there has undoubtedly been more resistance to genocide um, and more attempted rescues of genocide victims that have been reported in the literature, um, um, as, as I've sort of paraphrased here from, from a quote from Springer, um, because of course many of the people who did resist um, and fought back were killed and weren't able to write down what happened to them. And there were no witnesses left alive either in places like Treblinka to record that. So we always know we are working with a partial record. And particularly in the archeological record, we always know, of course, that we are only working with a partial record, particularly as my excavations have been minimally invasive, deliberately so to preserve the integrity of the camp landscape. Um, 
So I just I just also want to say um, before before um, I move on to the, the specific types of resistance that of course the landscape of Treblinka was actually inherently designed to prevent resistance, um, and I think when we look at the the topography of the site and the way that the camp was constructed, that immediately becomes apparent. The site for the extermination camp, for example, was chosen deliberately because it was in a remote area, because it was partly concealed by um, a small amount of forest at that time, um, less than there is now, but still um, a forested area. It was also deliberately chosen because it was near a labor camp and a quarry that gave the appearance that people were just going to this area to work. Um, and it was relatively remote, although it did, of course, have good connectivity through the railway line and the, and, and the roads. Um, the potential of people escaping, of course, they just would have escaped into the, the surrounding countryside where they could re relatively easily be caught. Um, and the architecture itself, of course, was designed to deceive people into thinking that they didn't need to resist. So um, when people arrived at Treblinka, um, from the, the, the 23rd of July, 1943 onwards, they were told that it was nothing but a transit stop. It was a place where they would come, they would hand over their belongings, they would um, take a shower, they would then um, go, go to the east, as it was described, to work, and they had nothing to worry about. And in the early phases, they were repeatedly told this on the reception camp area, and once Franz Stangl took over as commandant of the camp, even the architecture of the camp was modified to instill this in people that they did not need to fight back, that they were safe here. Um, and we have features like, for example, a mock railway station being built with signage indicating the direction of travel um, and people being told, take your towels with you because you're going to have a bath. And there was a whole almost a theatre, I think you could you could describe it as, um, that went on in the reception camp area to try and convince people that they did not need to revolt. Um, and, um, and, and you can see here also on the, on the screen, um, you can see a sketch by Samuel Willenberg, which shows a huge sandbank that was built between the reception camp area and the death camp area so that people couldn't see the gas chambers. Um, and the fences were lined with pine branches so that people couldn't see into that area, just to try and keep people under control. I mean, if we look at the, the this is a 3D model that's currently on display at the Treblinka Museum. Um, but if we look at this, it shows us the different areas of the camp. Um, and if you can see my cursor here, you can see the reception camp area. And again, the architecture was such that people were squeezed through this tiny pathway known as the road to heaven. So there was one way in and one way out, making resistance very, very difficult. And when they arrived at the gas chambers, um, for example, which um, this is the, the uh, second gas chamber building, the new gas chambers that were built. And this is the old gas chambers here, the first gas chambers to be built. And um, survivors talk about the architecture of these buildings being specifically designed, again, to prevent escape attempts. So we can see on the plan here that a narrow tunnel led into the area where the three gas chambers were. And there's a quote here from Oskar Stravchinsky, who said that the doors were so narrow that only a single person could squeeze through. This was to prevent anyone from turning back because the wave of the people behind and the narrowness of the entrance made it impossible. So the design um, of, these, of the structures is something that in my archeological work, I've really drilled into through witness testimony and archeological findings to really understand the fabric of these buildings and what they can tell you about the lengths that the Nazis went to, not only to deceive people, but also to quash, as I say, the resistance um, that they may potentially have faced. Um, and so um, I think with that in mind, obviously, it seems relatively impossible that people people actually did manage to to um, carry out acts of resistance. But as I said, actually, we see a huge array of acts of resistance that did take place at Treblinka. And these are just a few um, examples of, of which I'll run through shortly. But we had planned an actual escape attempt happening at individual and group level long before the revolt of August 1943. There were physical assaults and killings of guards, refusals to cooperate. There were attempts by people to witness what was happening, to document that and to send that information in particular back to Warsaw. Um, and many victims, of course, who escaped on the trains gave their testimonies to members of the um, Oneg Shabbat group who then subsequently recorded that for posterity. 
We see people smuggling and hiding items and information and also preparing for and inciting others to undertake participation in a revolt. And we see a huge array of resistance that was designed to enact a change in the camp, to rebel against the guards, but also personal acts of resistance as well, as we'll see um, in a moment. Um, so I'm going to run through these relatively swiftly so we can move on to some of the archaeological examples, but I just wanted to for those of you unfamiliar with, with Treblinka's history, um, highlight that th these are just a few examples of where we have um, individuals taking it upon themselves to escape um, so, and, and, and also to, um, to tackle the guards. So in the early period, quite a few people were able to escape on the trains. Um, so they either jumped from the trains on the way to the camp or they were able to go back on the empty trains after the personal belongings of victims had been taken. Um, from the victims, they were shipped back um, through Poland to Germany. So people managed to use that process, that commodification of the victims' belongings as a means to hide and to escape out of the camp. And largely that was because in the first phase, Ernfred Erbel ran a very chaotic camp. He was trying to perfect the killing process and it opened up the possibility for more escape attempts. And on the 11th of September 1942, um, SS Unterstumfuhrer Max Biauer was stabbed by Mia Berliner, who was a Jew from Warsaw, upon arrival in the camp. And in another instance, a young girl attempted to flee um, and then shot two of the Travniki men. And um, Jankel Wienik refers to her as their nameless heroine for the act that she carried out. So many of the other, many of the other prisoners witness um, these acts of, of um, attacks upon the guards and of course have varying responses to them. Some saw it as a threat to their existence because undoubtedly there were retaliations. Um, some saw, as, as we see here, that these people were, were, were heroes. Some were inspired to take their own action. Some quietly looked on. Um, another example from Viennik where he talks about um, an instance where um, I suppose one of the questions is always why, why didn't people resist more? Um, but we do actually have an instance with Treblinka where an entire train load of people actually did try um, and resist. Um, and um, here the Ukrainian guards, the Travniki men, um, Vienik says, told us that the people had come on a transport, had, been, had refused to be led into the gas chambers and had put up a fierce fight. And they smashed everything they could lay their hands on and broke open the chest with gold that stood in the corridor leading to the gas chambers. And they grabbed sticks and every weapon to defend themselves. And of course, this ultimately resulted in all of these people being killed. Um, and while this was happening, all the work Jews like Vienik were locked in their barracks. And to, to Vienik, this was a warning that they could not hope to escape their fate, knowing that those people had been so brutally murdered. Um, and what this ultimately led to, though, is, is one of the early um, signs of a collective revolt, in, uh, attempt at resistance, should I say, in Treblinka, in that um, there was an instance where seven men joined a plot to dig a tunnel through which they were planning to escape. And of course, they too were captured um, and they were tortured for the entire day. And then, as happened very often, their bodies were hung in the camp to show the other prisoners that resistance was actually futile. Um, so I, I ask you sort of to keep all of this in mind when you think about what actually then happened with the revolt, because all the people in the camp, of course, were witnessing this, these kinds of failed acts of resistance over many years in, in the case of people like Vienik who were in the camp for a long time. Um, and so now on to some more of the archaeological um, aspects of, of my work. I think for me, of course, um, many of the testimonies that have, that have been given um, by, um, by survivors and by people who didn't survive but survived long enough to tell their stories um, during the, the Holocaust are incredibly valuable as an archaeologist because they're the things that guide me to look for the, for the answers to the questions that we don't have. They are the sources that often... Um, you know, I can corroborate or sometimes challenge or sometimes supplement in the work that I do. Um, but of course, there are a number of testimonies that are actually also more than that. Um, in that, for example, the, the, the testimony of um, Abraham Shapitsky um, is in itself on so many levels um, connected to resistance. So he arrived in Treblinka on the 25th of August 1942. Um, and he um, actually escaped the camp. He spent 18 days in the camp um, before he escaped. And in his account, which he delivered to Rachel Auerbach from Oneg Shabbat, 
upon arrival in Warsaw, he described how witnessing mass murder at Treblinka, particularly of young children, led him to learn one in, important lesson, to escape, to escape from there, to see his revenge, and also to document what he'd seen. Um, and so obviously what he then did was gave his, his testimony. Um, so his, his escape, of course, was an act of resistance. His, his giving of his testimony and indeed in surviving was, were, were, were all acts um, of resistance in one way or another. But one specific thing that he did was absolutely vital um, in terms of, of, of interpreting some of my archaeological findings from Treblinka. And that is he, on one particular day, he decided that he finally had to give in to a temptation that he described he'd felt for, for a long time, that he wanted to see the most terrible part of the camp where the sinister crime, as he said, it was perpetrated against the Jews. And this was the gas chamber building. And he knew that this carried a huge risk, but he wanted to sneak inside and take a look. And so that is what he did. Um, he then wrote about this in his testimony and described the internal fixtures and fittings of the gas chamber. And he describes how it looked like a regular shower room with all the accoutrements of a public bathhouse, including nickel plated metal faucets, which were set into the ceiling. And he very importantly describes that the floor was covered with small orange terracotta tiles. Now, when I carried out my excavations at Treblinka in 2013, um, I was doing so because I believed I knew where the gas chambers, the first gas chambers, um, known as the old gas chambers, were located. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about how I knew that in a second. Um, and immediately upon excavating in this area, we came across these small tiles that you can see on the, on the top of the screen. Some were orange terracotta tiles exactly um, as Abraham Chubitsky described, others were a, a yellow, a yellow colour, and other other witnesses do talk about a combination of, of orange and yellow tiles. Um, so coupled with other evidence we had about the fact that the gas chambers were the only buildings in the death camp area that were built from brick, um, and coupled with spatial information um, about where we believe the gas chambers to be located, the discovery of these tiles was obviously very crucial in determining that this was the area of the old gas chamber building. And without descriptions like those of Shubitsky, you know, we, we would have been um, probably scratching our heads wondering what exactly, um, what exactly these were. And we know from testimonies that the Nazis modeled um, the, 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 um, the gas chambers on a bathhouse um, and indeed um, may well have even modeled it on a Jewish bathhouse specifically. We have many testimonies that talk about that. Um, and the tiles are, are indicative of that as well, because many of these same tiles have been found in Mikva, um, in the Warsaw and Lublin regions as well. So again, this is more evidence of this deception. Um, but these, these testimonies really um, obviously give us the voice that accompanies these material objects to explain what these finding, findings meant um, during the archaeological investigations. Um, and one of the reasons, that, again, we knew where to look really for the gas chambers um, was, was before all the archaeology, before all the tricks and the, and the, and the, the techniques, um, again, came from, from um, you know, testimonies written by people who'd escaped during the revolt or who would have actually resisted um, and escaped to tell their stories. Um, and most popular narratives suggested that the gas chambers were located near the memorial obelisk. Um, which was located quite close to the, the platform. And that's, that's here. Um, and, and this is the LIDAR model that I mentioned earlier. And um, however, when we, we read lots of testimonies, it became very apparent that the, the gas chambers must have been located further into the death camp area. And so being guided by voices of, of people like Abraham Shabitsky and Janko Wiernik and others, um, then I began my search in this other area um, uh, further into the camp zone. And you can see on the digital terrain model a slight indentation there, um, which was evidence that there may well be some buried remains. And the geophysical survey um, enabled us to map a structure that measures around about 22 metres by 15 metres, um, which ties in very closely with Vienick's description of the size of the old gas chamber. So all of this evidence coming together, um, uh, obviously this information that, that we were able to utilise from survivors was absolutely fundamental in our interpretation of the archaeological results. Um, and um, also there are many, uh, I haven't got time to go into kind of all of the details now, but I think uh, it's important to say that there are many buildings connected to resistance that we were also able to identify the locations of in the course of the archaeological survey and understand more about the movement of prisoners um, through the campscape 
and how the, how they were able to share information um, that led to many of those particular acts of resistance as well. Um, and um, I suppose one of the the really from the other from one extreme to the other in in the sense of the sort of the the um, uh, the larger scale phenomenon of, of of resistance writing, if you like, to to very personal acts of resistance that were exhibited in the archaeological findings. So we knew from testimony that when people arrived at Treblinka, they were forced to give over their personal belongings, as I mentioned before, as a way of making them believe that they were going to live. Um, and there were posters, there were signs telling people to surrender their valuables. Um, and um, again, as Vinik says here, um, the Ukrainian guards stood on the roofs of their barracks, machine guns that were ready to shoot anybody who didn't give over those objects. Um, and we have many testimonies that talk about this and people being killed because they wouldn't hand over objects and, um, and people certainly were aware of that threat. But when we carried out the excavations in the area of the gas chambers, we were very surprised to suddenly start to find personal effects in that area. Um, we didn't find a huge number, but then we didn't do a huge excavation either. I mean, our first trench was just a meter by a meter. But we did find small items of jewellery like this rose brooch that you can see at the top um, and also the small gold pendant that you can see at the bottom and other fragments of jewellery as well. And we know from testimonies that people were regularly, the bodies of the victims who were killed were regularly searched and that items were found on the bodies of victims. Um, so we know that people were smuggling into the camp the items that meant the most to them. The, you know, the personal items that they wanted to keep because they they were of sentimental value, perhaps. Um, of course, we can never really know the reasons why, because we don't have their voices. But for me, these objects are incredibly powerful um, because they do demonstrate that personal act of resistance that even though people knew what would happen to them if they didn't hand over their objects, they still um, kept hold of them. And also, of course, these objects allow us, you know, to, to have an insight into um, the people who were at Treblinka. It's often very easy to lose sight of individual stories in, in the, the narrative of, of Treblinka when we're talking about so many millions of people. So for me, these are exceptionally poignant um, discoveries that we made in the area of the, of the gas chamber in an, as I say, unexpected, unexpected location. So archaeology is, is also about what is found. It's also about where it's found as well um, that, is, that is important. And we have many other examples of, of things, uh, for example, hair clips being found in this area, which tell us that um, people were having their hair cut in the gas chambers sometimes when the camp was, was um, functioning to capacity. And that, again, is something that witnesses talk about a lot and the archaeological results um, seem to suggest that to be the case. Um, other acts of resistance as they relate to the sort of burial environment, if you like, because I'm also interested in what we haven't found, um, of course, as much as what we have. Um, and we have testimonies from survivors who talk about planting evidence as an act of resistance at Treblinka as well. And of course, one of the limitations that we have at this camp is that we can't excavate the whole site. Um, we can't excavate in the areas of the graves, but survivors do suggest that they did place evidence within the walls of graves, written evidence, notes, um, and that they also didn't cremate all of the remains of the victims when they were told to. Um, and so, so essentially, sort of from the winter of 1942 onwards, the Nazis tried to hide the traces of their crimes. And they decided that to do this, they would, they would begin to exhume the bodies of the victims that had been buried in mass graves. And from that point forward, any, any new people entering the camp would be cremated. And so working commandos were tasked with doing this um, and digging up those bodies, which is, is a, a truly unimaginable task to, to have had to have, have completed. And in the horror of all of this, you know, they, they thought about hiding some of, of the evidence. And one of the ways that they did that is, that, is as Abraham Goldfarb says here, that they, they put whole skeletons back into the graves where they were supposed to have cremated the bodies in the hope that somebody would come along, find not only the notes, but also find the remains of those individuals. Um, and so this, this is definitely countering the attempts by the Nazis to hide all of the traces of their crimes, which of course they, they tried to do so completely by, by through the cremation process. And we do know um, 
that it's it's it you know obviously again we excavated in a small area but we did excavate the gas chambers because we knew there there wouldn't be mass graves we had permission from the chief of our biopolum to do so but actually what we did find was scattered human remains in the course of those excavations and i can say from the small amount that we did find not all of them were burnt or at least not all of them were burnt entirely um so Again, I suppose it's relatively circumstantial um, information in that we haven't carried out this, uh, you know, we haven't excavated the whole site, um, but certainly uh, that, that evidence that we did find certainly suggests that not all of the remains of the victims were cremated to the extent um, that, that the, um, the, you know, that the Nazis claimed, uh, you know, certainly all, the, all, all so should I say that the historians claimed thereafter that the Nazis had been successful in doing so. Um, and we did find some direct evidence of the revolt of August 1943 as well. Um, we know that the armory in the camp was absolutely fundamental to the plan to carry out the revolt at Treblinka. Um, and it's this tower that you can see in this photograph here. It was called the Tyrolean Tower um, for, its, for its design. Um, and the, there were barracks um, near, near this originally as well, as I know Chris Webb pointed out in his talk. And um, in this area, we know that, that the, the armory itself um, was where the, the, um, the, the Jews on the, on the committee, organizing committee, had decided they were going to steal the weapons from in order to facilitate the revolt. And um, a locksmith made a key, well, there are different testimonies. Some say one key, some say 12 keys um, were made for the armory. And um, when the lock broke on the door so that somebody could go back, um, two boys actually could go back and get weapons. And they did this once. Um, they, they managed to go in and, and get some hand grenades, but unfortunately didn't realize that the detonators were stored separately. So they actually then had to go and take these grenades back so that the Germans didn't notice that they, they were missing. And that in itself delayed the revolt um, by some time. But then on the day of the revolt, they were successful once again at entering the armory and taking the weapons that they, they did use. So obviously this area, the structure was very important to the revolt itself. So when I first started doing the mapping project of the camp, um, doing my walkover survey, I was immediately drawn to this depression that you can see in the photograph on the left hand side. You can probably see a raised bank around the outside and a, an area of grass in the middle. Um, and I carried out some geophysical survey um, of, of the area, um, this time using a technique called resistance survey that looks for um, high and low resistance measurements in the soil. Um, and this, you can see here, the shape of the bank um, and, and uh, of, the, of the area here matched what was, what was visible on the ground. Um, and then we did some small scale, there were small scale, I don't have a photo of that, sorry. Um, but we did do some small scale excavations in the edge of the bank as well to verify that there were, there were um, remnants of a structure in this location. So this is where we believe um, the armory was located. And we also found a well in this area of the camp as well. Um, but obviously in terms of you know, my work, the excavations were relatively, um, as I said, sort of relatively small, um, small scale. I have no doubt there is more evidence um, to be found obviously beneath the ground at Treblinka in, in general, an abundance of evidence, but also I, I know that obviously the more excavations that were carried out, the more evidence hopefully of, of those resistance activities we, we might be able to find um, in the terrain, because we do have many testimonies that talk about people burying, evidence, burying materials, for example, to go back to, to use in the revolt um, as well. So there's certainly more work to be done in that area. Um, as I mentioned, the actual um, the actual revolt itself did result in some of the workshops and the garage, for example, being burnt down. So that's an area in the SS um, camp that hasn't yet been investigated archaeologically, um, and then they, they were they were destroyed in the course of, of that revolt. Um, the plan to destroy the gas chambers wasn't successful, but of course, I think it's fair to say that the landscape that we see at Treblinka, the the archaeological evidence that we see in general. Um, much of what we see, the destruction of the camp, the evolution, of course, stemmed from the revolt. There was a rapid escalation after the revolt in the, um, the attempt to erase the buildings, to level the landscape and to hide that the camp had ever existed there as well. Um, so ultimately, in, in some ways, uh, the resistors achieved their goal in terms of, of stopping the camp um, from having as many transports as it did. But as I said, ultimately, they, they sadly weren't as successful as they hoped to be. Um, in terms of the number of people who survived. 
Um, and so I'm aware that I am running out of time, but I would also just like to say a, a few short things, um, if I may, and Juma Dean, stop me if I go on too long. Um, but I would like to say just a few things about the Labour camp at Treblinka, because it is it is a lesser known history. It is a, it is a lecture in its own right, and I haven't got time to explain the archaeological findings in too much detail. But I wanted to show some connections to resistance that I think are really important and as yet really um, not very well documented. So the Labour camp itself was located to the south of the extermination camp close to a quarry. And there was a um, cemetery and um, really an execution, what was an execution site, just south of it in the landscape. So when we talk about Treblinka, really, we should talk about all of this, all of this landscape because it's all connected. Um, the labour camp was notoriously brutal, um, you know, in, in, in a nutshell from, from the research that I've done, a lot of my book, half of my book, in fact, focuses on, on the brutality in the labour camp and the fact that, again, the term labour camp was a ruse for um, an extremely brutal landscape where the guards viewed killing as a sport and they tried to find the most brutal ways to murder people. They believed bullets were too good for Jews in many cases. And so they, they killed people with hammer blows. Um, and other terrible forms of, of torture. Um, and so this camp was really an unbearable place to live. Um, so it's probably not surprising, therefore, that there were attempts to resist, which haven't been as well recorded because often the history of the labor camp is overlooked because of the, the, um, the horrendous crimes, of course, that were happening at the extermination camp. And I should say that both Jews and non-Jewish Poles were housed, in, and also Czech Jews and German Jews and, and a small number of Roma were housed in the labor camp in different areas. And so this is a map that I've created as a result of the archeological investigations, which shows the main camp um, and a small farm area associated with the camp as well. Um, and I've done a lot of work looking at the, what was visible from what structure, what happened in each building um, and, and how that, that architecture of oppression functioned um, in this particular site. Um, and as I say, that's another talk. Um, but um, one thing that I think is very interesting about the Labour camp is that it had the same commandant all the way through. And he really ran the camp like a fiefdom. Um, and he controlled all of the decision making processes. And so I'm not, I, I sort of, I, some of the things I'm putting in here, I guess, are sort of related to resistance sort of tangentially. But I thought this was a really interesting example of the power dynamics between the two camps, because I think it's totally unexpected. So when Treblinka 2, the extermination camp, was in the process of being constructed, the working brigade who were responsible for doing this went to the nearby town of Kosovlaski, and they had a list of demands of, of things that they wanted to finish the camp, um, and they were going to requisition them from the Jewish community in Kosovlaski. And what is really interesting is that the head of the Judenrat actually resisted those demands. They refused to give over the materials, and they then went to the camp commandant of Treblinka, Treblinka 1 and said, we're being asked these unreasonable requests. We already give so much to you. Why should we give any more? And remarkably, Van Oypen agreed. And he stood down the, um, the, the Nazi SS officers who'd made the demands for material. So I find that remarkable. Firstly, that the Jews in Kosovlaski actually were brave enough to, to stand up and say no. Um, and secondly, that, that Van Oypen had the power to say no to the working brigade who were constructing, you know, obviously what became the second largest killing facility of the Holocaust. Um, so I think this is a really remarkable example of, um, of, 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 of resistance, but also, I guess, that, that sort of exertion of power um, that the, the Labour camp director um, certainly had. Um, and we do also have direct archaeological um, evidence of resistance from the labor camp as well. So we know that a number of uh, Travniki men of Vakman were killed by labor camp inmates. And these are just a few examples. Um, so, for example, on the 9th of November 1942, a Vakman was killed by inmates that he was guarding in the forest when they, they jumped upon him and killed him. Um, and we also know another one named Veronko was killed. Um, by a Jewish inmate who hit him with a shovel in March 1943. And I have some other names of, of Ackman who were killed. And in 2019, the Institute of National Remembrance in Poland conducted um, excavations at the execution site south of the labor camp, which I um, went to witness. And one of the things that were discovered at that time were um, seven individual graves, complete with wreaths, 
So they had a, a you know a, a formal burial in a coffin, um, with a, usually with a with a wreath laid on top. And we know from reports that this was the way in which the um, Travniki men who died in the camp were buried. So um, the team from from ITN and the University of Sheshin are carrying out, um, I know, further investigations to help identify the individual skeletons that were excavated from those graves. And maybe we can make that connection between those those instances that we have in the um, written record about acts of resistance where guards, not all the guards who, who died, were obviously died from inmate resistance, but some died from disease or from, from their own um, sometimes drunken behaviour, for example, um, or being killed by the SS guards. But in a number of instances, they were killed by inmates. So here we see we see very concrete acts of resistance. Um, and um, just as a, as a, as a sort of, uh, I suppose, a final, um, I think, remarkable example, um, because there are too many and, and I just wanted to share a few. One of the key testimonies that we have from the Labour camp is by a gentleman named uh, Mishaswav Vodso. Uh, and he gives a really detailed account of the growing unrest in the Labour camp, partly influenced by the fact that they can continually smell the cremation of the bodies from the Labour camp. They can continually see transports arriving when they themselves are, are going to work. They see their fellow Labour camp inmates being taken to the forest and shot regularly and occasionally being sent to the um, gas chambers, to, to the extermination camp and to the gas chambers to be killed. They see their numbers dwindling. They also see the, the lesser transports coming into the extermination camp and realise that eventually the whole operation at Treblinka may be shut down and they too may be killed. And he documents this in quite a lot of detail. And he said that basically the, the inmates in Treblinka 1 were always suspicious when the, when the guards were nice to them. Um, and the SS ran the labor camp as well. And when they were nice to them, they knew that an action was coming. So there, there were several attempts for them to resist, escape, and, and some people were successful. But they too formed a special committee to plan a revolt in the labor camp. Um, and on a number of occasions, they tried to, to um, enact these escapes. But one remarkable example that um, I've recorded from this testimony is that um, they actually formed a special working committee um, called the Vega Bau, which they tried to use as a way to make contact with inmates in the death camp. So they, they started to work on the road between the extermination camp and the labor camp, and they tried to find the opportunity to speak to the death camp inmates so that they could do a co coordinated revolt between the two camps. Um, and so they tried this for a long time. They tried to make contact. It was very difficult. Eventually, they did manage this. Um, when a, a group from the extermination camp came to repair the fence with pine branches. And they were able to have a, a conversation by basically pretending they were talking loudly to their own fellow camp inmates, but really they were talking to each other. Um, and they shared with each other this sense of nervousness that they would soon be killed and this desire to escape. And what I think is really remarkable as testimony is that the death camp inmates, having heard about what the labor camp inmates had experienced, gave them their food packages and financial aid, which I just think is incredible, um, given obviously the situation that the, um, you know, the, the, the people in the extermination camp um, were suffering. But I think knowing what I know from the archaeological investigations that I've done of the execution site at Treblinka labor camp and of the um, the architecture and the history, uh, the historical sources that document the brutality that happened in that camp, I do understand why. Because actually the labour camp was so brutal and so awful that having heard those accounts, I think obviously clearly the, the death camp inmates had a very visceral reaction to that and wanted to help um, their fellow um, Jewish um, inmates. And so Essentially, the, the committee at Treblinka 1 was very inspired by um, the fact that the, the um, extermination camp inmates were trying to plan a revolt as well. They formed their committee and they decided that they would try and revolt at any cost. And they were about to do this. Um, but actually, then a transport from the Warsaw Ghetto arrived after the uprising. Um, and that changed the whole environment in the camp, increased the number of guards that were present and prevented those escape attempts um, on a number of occasions. Um, some of the people did manage to escape, also obviously did. Um, unfortunately, the labor camp itself was liquidated in July 1944, 
um, and um, the hundreds of Jews who remained in the camp were brutally murdered um, at the execution site as well. But some of them did manage to escape. So there's much more material I could have said about the labour camp, but I think it's important to point out that resistance there was happening and there was definitely inspiration um, and connection and a relationship between the, the, the two camps. Um, and also Vienik talks about this as well in terms of, of these connections between um, the two sites and, and, and the death camp guards wanting to make connections with the labour camp inmates as well so that they could plot together. So it was reciprocated. Um, I'm going to skip, um, actually, I'll just briefly mention this, but then I'll, then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, also, I should say that um, Samuel Reisman said that the when the revolt happened in August 1943, um, the reason they chose the time of 4.30 for that was because they knew that a, a train load of inmates from the labor camp would pass by at 4.45 and they hoped that they would join in with the revolt. So there's another connection there. Sadly, as it happens, the guards from the labor camp actually did come and help with quashing the, um, the um, revolt on the 2nd of August, 1945. So um, again, another, another connection, but one which ultimately, of course, resulted in the deaths of many of the people who tried um, to escape at that time. Um, so I know I've run over by a few minutes there, but I, I, as I say, there was there was there was a lot to say um, and, and too much as usual um, uh, that I have to say about Treblinka. But I think I just wanted to point out that obviously resistance takes many forms. I have, I, you know, I've chosen a, a few examples of, of, of hundreds and hundreds of documents, um, you know, that, that tell of resistance happening in Treblinka, some at a personal level, some at a group level. And I think hopefully I've tried to demonstrate that by examining not only oral testimony, but also the material and spatial evidence of resistance, we can hopefully find out more in the future um, about these more, um, about the overt acts of resistance, but also the subtle forms um, as well. And, the, and the, this combination the study of, of both the extermination and labor camps, you know, for me has been um, incredibly revealing about the history of both sites. But I think particularly when we consider those connections around resistance, we can see that there are many. Um, and I think we need to we need to invest a lot more energy, actually, in understanding the relationships between the killing centers and, and other sites associated with them, um, particularly when we are talking about resistance. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Um, I don't think there could be enough time. It's never enough time. So thank you so much for squeezing so much yep. into uh, your presentation. I kept taking pictures of the of the different <laughs> slides because as someone who uh, literally every day talks about uh, Treblinka, uh, to see the excavations, to see uh, so much information that, that is out there. And actually someone asked, and you maybe want to answer that, uh, while you, you're on is talking, what other books can we read? Of course, we have Chris Webb, but uh, if you have other recommendations for what we can read, and I'm waiting for your book to come out, and you have to let me know. I will we'll launch <laughs> and uh, make that happen oh, as well. Thank you so, much. so again, yeah. thank you so much for an intriguing, uh, very different uh, type of presentation that I think is really the first time I've had that type of uh, uh, experience. Uh, of an excavation, archaeology, and putting it all together with historical and uh, uh, oral testimonies, and like you said, multidisciplinary. So, Thank you. bravo. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, <laughs> so uh, please stay with us. I know that usually after an hour, people start saying, okay, that's enough. It's time to go. But I do want to invite those that are still with us to give us a few more minutes because we have an incredible virtual tour. And I just want to introduce our uh, next speaker that I started to do by accident a little while ago. So I'm talking about my colleague, my dear colleague, Yohan Tsu, uh, who for the past uh, eight years has been the pedagogical director at the Ghetto Fighters House Museum. During this time, he has been involved and led the development of innovative digital educational platforms within the museum and online. As part of his responsibilities, he developed the museum's educational programs and content, which includes the guiding outline within, within the museum, the catalog, online workshops, virtual tours like the one we'll see, and other new platforms. Yaron continues to promote educational programs that engage museum visitors through dialogue that delves into dilemmas, focusing on choices made during the Holocaust and their relevance to our lives today. He is a very busy guy, so I am happy that he had time to uh, be with us this evening. The floor is yours, Yaron.
Medine, thank you very much. And I just like to say, uh, like you, uh, I feel really, really wowed uh, after this last uh, talk because uh, both uh, you and I have been dealing with Treblinka in our museum for many years. And I think that it takes a lot to feel that you really learn something new uh, about something that you know about. And then suddenly you understand that <laughs> you don't know much about, which is, I think, in terms of education, a good feeling. Uh, so uh, it, it was a pleasure, really, to, to hear this uh, this talk. And I'd like to take you for a few minutes, as Medine said before, to one of our virtual tours uh, in the Hall of Camps, one of our core exhibitions in the museum. And there to see and view um, a model, a very unique model created by Yaakov Viernik, uh, which Caroline just talked about, I think, many times uh, during her talk. Uh, so let's delve inside. Okay, just a second. Let's make this clean. Okay, so the Hall of Camps is a core exhibition in our museum. And as you see, in order to get to this exhibition, you need to go uh, towards downwards in the museum. And that's uh, metaphorically as low as you can get uh, in our museum. So let's, so let's do this and go downwards. And the first, uh, the first thing you'll see when you arrive in the exhibition will be this model, this model of the Treblinka camp created by Yaakov Yernik. He created this model in the 50s to the request of the founders of the kibbutz and the museum, Yitzhak Zuckerman and Tzivya Lubitkin. And this model, I think its uniqueness is that because Yaakov was one of the, I'd say, one of the only prisoners in Treblinka who would walk all around the camp because of his uh, work as a carpenter, uh, of course, as a forced labor comp carpenter in the camp, he, he was forced to build uh, some of the barracks uh, in Treblinka. And later on, when he tried to remember what this camp actually looked like, this is his memory, based, by the way, on the sketch over here. Let me just show you that for a second, which he created in Warsaw after he, uh, he wasn't a prisoner in Treblinka uh, anymore. So I want to just, before, we go a little bit inside into uh, what this is. I want to read to you uh, a few words about uh, what Yaakov uh, wrote in his book, A Year in Treblinka. One day all this will come to an end and evil will be eradicated. The day will come and on the ruins of cities, souls will build new homes, Babies will be born again, and children will play on the roadsides. Life will go on because that's the way of the world. The sun will rise, everything will prosper again, and no one will remember. I shudder at the thought that no one will know, and even more afraid that no one will believe. I dread at the thought that we, the few, the survivors of terror, will be considered insane if we tell our story. A generation will pass from the world. The eyes of the last witnesses will be covered with dirt rugs, and with them will come the end of memory. Only one thing burns inside of me and urges me to tell accurately and immediately. Yaakov Yernik. So to us, this model is 
something very unique because it tries to give us the memory of a place that doesn't exist anymore. There is no Treblinka. There's a very amazing uh, site. And now we know from Caroline also an excavation site, but there aren't any prisoners and no witnesses anymore. There's the testimonies and there's this model uh, created by Yaakov Elnik, who saw the camp for what it was for a whole year between 42 and 43. So what is uh, this camp? Looking it from the model. So we have the, the railway tracks over here, giving you a sense that the train is leaving the main road and then later on will return to the main tracks, which of course is false. It doesn't really happen because the train doesn't go anywhere anymore, any, any later on. It will end just a few uh, hundred meters uh, afterwards. The victims will get off the train over here. And as Caroline mentioned before, we have the barracks over here when they are forced to take their clothes off. And from here, to the very horrific path uh, to the gas chambers, the new gas chambers, the old gas chambers are over here. And in these gas chambers, there are five rooms on this side, five on this side, 10 rooms, uh, which are gas chambers. There are uh, the sites where the corpses are later on thrown inside these pits. And over here on the other side of the camp is where the prisoners live, over here. The Ukrainian guards, over here. And the SS barracks and offices, over here. Now, when looking at, uh, at this, as a model, first of all, it's it's really small. I mean, relatively small, because if, for example, we create a model of, let's say, Birkenau or Maidanek, it would take the whole floor, the whole exhibition. Uh, Treblinka is, you know, it's not much lar larger than a football stadium, okay? because there aren't many barracks for the prisoners because most of the people that will get off the train won't be living for more than a few hours. So, uh, Maydeen, I know that I don't have a lot of time, so just tell me if, uh, if that's that, uh, or, do I, or should I go a little bit more into detail uh, within the camp? I think you can take a few more minutes. Um, that's fine. I think what we decided to do is keep the Q&A uh, out tonight and to uh, send the questions to you. Uh, so there is a Great. question, for example, about one of the quotes. So absolutely take uh, a few more minutes. This is a, an, a rare opportunity for everyone. So, and people are saying- I, I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> Please continue. So, so wonderful. Okay. So going back to where uh, the victims first arrive uh, we have uh, over here uh, the barracks where uh, their uh, their luggage their suitcases uh, and other things are taken uh, you saw that in the presentation of caroline before it looks a little bit different uh, it's much it's much more presentative because it's one of the first buildings they will see when they arrive. But not too far from there over here, that's the Lazaret. This is a place that looks like, uh, you know, um, a field hospital or a very small field hospital, uh, even with the Red Cross on it. And But uh, the people, the, the elderly, the sick, that on the train didn't feel good or that uh, they could maybe make the lines go a little bit slower were taken aside and after everyone would go into the gas gas chambers from over here they were taken over there to the lazarette 
and they would be executed. And you can see right over here, just a second, that there's actually behind this, this very short barrack, there's a pit where they would be executed uh, inside. So they would actually be one of the first victims uh, when arriving uh, at the camp. <clears throat> now, one more thing that I'd like to show you is actually that Treblinka is divided into two camps. Okay, just a second, let's see it from over here. Okay. So you have this area over here where you can see that there's an actual fence within the camp itself. It's dividing this part of the camp, which is the death camp, the extermination camp, okay? With this area over here, which are, as I said before, the prisoners, the Ukrainian guards, the SS. The prisoners from this side of the camp don't go to this part of the camp. And the prisoners that are here, what we would call in other camps, Zondo Commando, the prisoners that are in charge of the gas chambers uh, over here, they wouldn't go to this part uh, of the camp. Uh, everything in their lives, if it's laundry or uh, their food or anything, it all happens uh, over here in this area. So uh, the information won't move from one place in the camp to another. Uh, those who saw, for example, the escape for Sobibor, which is one of the three camps in part of, uh, that are part of the Reinhardt uh, program of uh, Belgium's Sobibor Treblinka. So it looked a little bit like this camp, Again, it was a it was a film, so it's uh, it's not uh, totally accurate, but you can see what I was talking about in that film about the the how the camp is divided into two different parts. So this camp existed for a a year, a little a little bit more than a year. During that time in this camp, I saw one of the questions before: how many were actually uh, exterminated in Treblinka. So there's an argument uh, to this day. Uh, the formal number, maybe Tamir and Caroline would like to also to react to that later on, is uh, 870,000 uh, victims. Uh, I've heard of 900,000, and I've also heard of a million and 200,000. But again, uh, there are different uh, point of views, uh, but the formal number, again, uh, if Caroline and Tamir would like to uh, uh, react to that later on, is I know is uh, 870,000 uh, victims that were exterminated uh, during this year. Um, okay, so I think that uh, at least uh, from this uh, point of view, uh, will be quite enough. I just want to say one more thing uh, about this model is that uh, to us in our museum, uh, this I, I would have to say this is one of the most important uh, artifacts that we have in our museum. Just imagine that it's been sitting in our museum for more than 60 years. And uh, I think that to many of our young visitors, it really gives them a glimpse of uh, how a camp like Treblinka works. Uh, many of them are very shocked about how small uh, this camp uh, was because they've heard a lot about uh, Treblinka. Uh, and I think that in terms of bringing memory and bringing the idea that people who were able to survive that era that one of their main missions in life, life is to bring the story. Even if they believe that no one will believe, that I believe is also an important part of spiritual resistance during the Holocaust, but also in the years uh, after the Holocaust. So thank you very much uh, for your time.
Uh, John, before we say goodbye to everyone, could you please put up the what uh, Veronique wrote in the book? Someone was asking to see that again. It made a very yes, big impression. So just put that up while we're saying goodbye. Yes, <laughs> I yes, think we'll of just course. leave it up. Um, so, Maybe just, just a, a short note about, uh, yeah. if I may, about the importance of the model is that uh, from my side of research, that I know that the prosecution team in the Damiano case, actually when they began their work, they arrived immediately to the ghetto fighter house and they learned the model. And actually we have a letter in uh, the ghetto, ghetto house uh, museum that they, are, they appreciate uh, uh, the model and want to thank the team uh, for explaining them exactly uh, what was going on in the camp uh, with the help of the of uh, Vjernik uh, model. So that's about the importance here. And also for the Eichmann trial. Yes, exactly. That's what I wanted to say. Of course. They wanted to take the model, but they couldn't take it to Jerusalem because it's so mm -hmm. large. So they took two, I think, two large pictures uh, of the exactly. model. And Yaakov Vjernik himself gave Test testimony. Testified in an in a Eichmann trial, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I want to thank all our speakers. We knew from the beginning this is going to be a, a, a longer program, but I thought that it was very important to have these three different perspectives. That's why we called it the tangible witnesses. Uh, Tamir, Caroline, and Yogon, thank you for your uh, knowledge and for pre presenting in such a, an interesting and intriguing way uh, this camp that someone said, why do we keep calling it the extermination camp? It was absolutely a killing death camp, but I think it's just something that's uh, engraved in our heads uh, that uh, so much evil and so much death and so much tragedy could take place uh, in such a small area. And also to look at it from a perspective of how do we see resistance? Uh, if it's through Wernick's uh, model, uh, making this tangible evidence uh, on Caroline's uh, excavations, showing how people actually left things in places and hid them, which is something that someone asked about. And, um, and for your own, showing us how the model is uh, presented in our museum. Again, you can also press on some of the buttons and get more information, uh, like the quote from Vernick's book. And I wanna thank the audience, those that are still with us and those that left, that's fine um, for being with us uh, in this third program. Um, I wanna invite everyone again for the final program that will take place on February 9th. Um, everyone here will get an invitation because you're registered and everyone in our database will be getting information about the next program. I just wanna thank my partners, Tally Nates and uh, Jacob for uh, bringing this series together. Uh, what we will do, is take up all the questions in the chat box. We will send them to our speakers and ask them uh, to give uh, short answers, if possible, to uh, these questions. By the way, if you were looking in the chat box, someone said that they're related to one of the people that made the key. That was uh, for the, uh, yes, look, Caroline, I will send you all the chat box. Thank and you. So someone, Tamir, who says that I think father was involved in uh, the trial in Munich. So we had an incredible audience as well. And I want to say to everyone, shalom, and we will see you in a few weeks for our final program. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.